Tonight on Greater Boston with former Celtics coach Ime Yudoka likely headed to the Brooklyn Nets just weeks after a one-year suspension here in Boston for inappropriate conduct. What does that say about the attitude toward women and the world of sports? Former Division I women's basketball player Nefertiti Walker and sports journalist Shira Springer join me. Plus, local business leader Rob Hale once turned a bet with a friend over shaving into an annual charity event that's raised more than $47 million for cancer research. Governor Charlie Baker convinced me to join him and hundreds of others in shaving my head for a very good cause. Now Rob and his wife are giving away $1 million every week for a year to small nonprofits. He joins me on the reasons behind it all. When news first broke that Celtics head coach Ime Yudoka was suspended for a year for, quote, violations of organizational policies, there was talk of the possibility he would never coach in the NBA again. But now, although unconfirmed as of this taping, reporting first by ESPN, then later The Globe, indicates the Brooklyn Nets are about to hire him as their head coach, I guess never means five weeks. And if it doesn't happen, it's clear that it's only because of all the blowback since the news first leaked. Either way, it's once again raising questions about the circumstances surrounding his suspension here in Boston. The Celtics have said very little about the whole thing, even as several of its female employees were unfairly doxxed by Internet investigator wannabes. But reports indicate an independent investigation found that Yudoka used crude language in his dialogue with a female subordinate prior to the start of an improper workplace relationship with the woman. So less than a month and a half later, do the Nets know something we don't, or do they just think what Yudoka did was not that big a deal? And what does this likely move say about how women working in sports and playing are treated? I'm joined by sports journalist Shira Springer, lecturer at MIT's Sloan School of Management, and Nefertiti Walker, who played Division I women's basketball at Georgia Tech, then Stetson, was the top 40 WNBA pre-draft selection, signed to play professionally in Germany, but opted to pursue a PhD instead. She is now Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and a Professor of Sport Management at UMass Amherst. Nefertiti, great to see you, Shira, great to see you. Likewise. Happy to be here. Great. Nefertiti, let me start with you. What was your re initial reaction to, I guess, the shortest one-year suspension in history? <laughs> you know, it was interesting, right? Because, again, uh, there's so much has been kept undercover as far as the details of the suspension and the details of what happened that caused the suspension. But it certainly tells us the hierarchy of oppressions that we're willing to accept in the workplace. I mean, in my opinion, in some ways, the Nets moving forward with Udoka suggests that one, perhaps this is a distraction from the Kyrie drama that's happening yeah. right now. And if they are using this particular incident, which is really sort of deeply entrenched in, in sexist ideals and stereotypes about women in the workplace, to distract people from Kyrie and the anti-Semitism that's been tied to some of his comments in recent posts, then su certainly they're suggesting that this is less of an issue for them than that. You know, um, which, God, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, which, which just suggests, again, women are falling at sort of the bottom of the totem yeah. pole for oppression in the workplace. You know, and for those who don't know, the Kyrie Irving was the retweeting of a, a post with a, about a, uh, an anti-Semitic uh, film about which the Nets, by the way, did absolutely nothing, uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. And then this comes up. So my take, my initial take on this, Shira, is not only is it outrageous, but what message is being sent to the women who work in the office at the Nets, a kind of a facility? What is the answer to that? Yeah, I think you bring up a very good point about what message is being sent, because this is a workplace. This is where women expect to be treated fairly and to be valued. And I think that one of the messages being sent is that you're not valued enough. I think that's across sports when you have these issues, whether it's players who have committed acts of domestic violence, and I'm not equating them, but when there are issues with um, men behaving badly, men doing inappropriate things, whether it's sexual harassment, domestic violence, etc., and then you bring them back into the workplace. I'm thinking of Deshaun Watson, too, yeah. with the Cleveland Browns. He's going to be in the field gonna, in a gonna month. Be, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when these things happen, I think you are st making a statement about how, how little you value women or how little you respect them in the workplace and create a whole range of other issues for those women. You know, uh, Nefertiti, I'm glad that Shira said across sports because for those watching who are not huge sports fans who think this is an outlier, I have two words for them, Dallas Cowboys, 
also Washington football team. This, this is not an outlier. There's a whole history of women who work for not on the field or on the court, we'll get to that in a minute, work for these organizations being treated like second and third class citizens, no? Oh, absolutely. And some of the research that we've done here at UMass and um, my former doc student who's now a professor at Stonehill College has done this work as well with me. We've basically uncovered some of the reasons why women are treated this way, right? There's a stereotype that the women that work in sport are there because they want to sleep with the athletes or the high level executives uh. that are leading the sport teams. So when these things are when these things happen, typically people blame the woman. Um, she must have been the one that encouraged this relationship, um, and that's one of the reasons why it's so easy for these men to move on and get another job. Because the, at the root of this is that organizations don't take sexism very seriously, and, and sport organizations in particular. Yeah, and also you, you just what you just said reminded me, sure. Before we move on to the field or the court, is if I read the word consensual one more time. Mm -hmm in the news reporting on this when it initially broke. No question, there's a guy high on the totem pole with a woman who is by definition not on his level. Mm -hmm. And it was consensual, 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 mm -hmm. indicating to me a, either an intentional or an unintentional total misunderstanding of what Nefertiti was just talking about. Yeah, of the power dynamics, yeah, exactly. right? So it's playing exactly into those stereotypes. And I think going um, with what Nefertiti was saying, there's another issue at play here. Which is? Which is that um, when you hire women in these sports jobs, often you know people see that as checking off an item. You yeah. know, you need to have we need to have to get the optics right. We need to have a woman in this executive position, or we need to have a female presence in some of the executive level positions. And so there's one or two women there. There's not a critical mass, and that also leads to issues. Can we go uh, from the the office to the field or the court or the mat, whatever? <laughs> Can you remind everybody knows the story about Larry Nasser? This monster mm -hmm. is going to spend the rest of his life in jail. Not one woman, not a dozen, 150. 100, yep. And then the incredible testimony from some very high profile gymnasts in front of Congress. Talk about courage. It was unbelievable. Can you remind people why this was allowed to go on for so long? It was allowed to go on because nobody believed the young gymnasts when they made reports against Nasser. That's the bottom line. These young gymnasts were not believed. Um, and there was a group, quite frankly, of male leaders, in large part, who were passing along these complaints, covering up these complaints by these young gymnasts. Why? Because they were worried about sponsor reaction. They saw these young gymnasts as a way to enhance the glory of the Olympic movement, of the U.S. Olymp uh, uh, US Associ uh -huh. Gymnastics Association. So there were a lot of factors in play, but basically, bottom line, they didn't believe the young girls. And there was a culture where these young women were not valued. And I shouldn't have assumed people know Larry Nasser was obviously a doctor who was sexually abusing yes. these women in serial fashion. You know, Nefertiti, to show the hurdles that women who uh, have pleas here for safety are unheard, it wasn't just the infrastructure of the, the gym community. When I read the story a few months ago about how they reported this information to the FBI in Indianapolis, which did absolutely nothing and it turns out the reason they did nothing is the head of the office in Indianapolis had applied for a job with the Gymnastics Association of America. I mean, it's almost like inescapable cover-up and corruption that these women are up against. Exactly, and you know, part of the problem is certainly the stereotypes that exist about women in the workplace and the reasons why they're there, but also I think the power of sport and the infrastructure of sport and sort of the socio-historical context of sport being a place created for the advancement of men. And we're trying to undo that now with having hiring women in high ranking positions and the policies that are being changed and the research that's being done to uncover the deep levels of sexism that exist. But the reality is this is how one, you get a job in sport by who you know and you're networking. And sport has been a place that's been dominated by men and, and toxic masculinity. And, you know, I, I'm I, sorry, say, and I would add to what Nefertiti is saying that not only has it been dominated men, by men, but it's men in positions of power, in decision-making positions, in leadership positions that perpetuate a culture that is sexist and discriminates against women and oppresses women at every turn and creates cultures that lead to situations like what happened with Larry Nasser. And so there's a lot of hurdles to overcome. And part of those hurdles, one of those hurdles, one, maybe several of those hurdles involve 
getting women to occupy, creating pipelines for women to occupy leadership positions where they can make decisions in the best interest of other women in the workplace and, quite frankly, of, of, of fem young female athletes, as was the case uh, with Larry Nassar. Yeah, I want to talk about fixes a little bit more in a minute, mm -hmm. but just for people watching who think, well, this whole notion that female athletes aren't safe, if we had a two-hour program, we could give you two hours of examples and fast forward to the National Women's Soccer League, Sally mm -hmm. Yates, former mm -hmm. actor, Attorney General. Here's what part of the report she did, an extensive report. Our investigation has revealed a league in which abuse and misconduct, verbal and emotional abuse and sexual misconduct had become systemic, spanning multiple teams, coaches, and victims. So this notion that that was then, this is now, is total BS. You know, Nefertiti, what it seems to me is that the odds of getting caught, outed, and seriously punished, unlike unseriously punished, like Sean, uh, Deshaun Watson we talked about a minute ago, quarter of a billion dollar contract and big deal, he misses what, nine or 10 or 11 games. The odds of all those things happening are so small, there's almost no disincentive to bad behavior. Did, did I get that out? You, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Oh, I, I agree completely. Not only are the odds of being um, punished very slim, but also the institution itself supports the cover up of it, right? Yeah. I mean, time and time again, we see in some ways people are rewarded by having bigger contracts and Deshaun Watson by being able to move on and, and coach, you know, mega superstars in the example of Udoko. So, you know, I think, yes, the punitive piece of it is lessened and it does not happen very often, but also the reward piece of it, of getting out That's of a particular a messy point. situation and, and getting a better job and a better opportunity and more money happens way too often. Sure, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to say there was, over the summer, a peer review study about the consequences that NFL players suffer as a, re as a result of domestic violence arrests. And it found that the career consequences were quote unquote negligible. And that in fact, 75% of the players, and they didn't have to be stars, they were, you know, it could be average or slightly below low average, that 75% of the players who were arrested for domestic violence suffered no long-term career consequences because of those arrests. I think that speaks volumes about the priorities and the message that the NFL is sending despite all its campaigning and optics surrounding you know, prevention of domestic violence. You know, Nefertiti, a minute or two ago, Shira offered some fixes, for lack of a better expression. And I, I, I don't know if, I, maybe I was going to be too nervous to say what she hinted at. You need more women in these high places and fewer men. It's not a guarantee, but it sure as hell is a step in the right direction. Beyond that, assuming you subscribe to that notion, what else needs to be done? Well, I think you need more women just, you know, for equity reasons, right? But I also think you need more men who prescribe to the ideals of equity as well. There are plenty of men out there who have very strong feelings about moving forward in equitable ways. But until we get to a point where we even have equitable access for women, that really should be the focus, as Shara said. I also think when these types of issues surface, then we can't expect an organization who is looking out for themselves, who is trying to win games, to then also be able to appropriately oversee themselves. Yeah. There needs to be an external organization that is able to come in and really oversee these situations and be able to assess and make recommendations to the institutions themselves, as opposed to having to the institutions try to, in some ways, police themselves, which we've seen does not work for any of them. Um, so I think that's the first step. Yeah, I think you make an excellent point about organizations trying to police themselves and that not being a good solution. One thing that we've seen with the NWSL is the establishment of a players union, the, the NWSL Players Association. So I think in addition to getting more women in leadership positions in these league and team structures, as well as cultivating more male allies who care about issues of equity, establishing strong players associations where the players have a voice in how the league is run and safety measures that are installed is another key aspect and potential solution. And we can end by the, on. on the fact that one of the women who reported the abuse and was ignored in the National Women's Soccer League is now chair of the committee yes. that is going to oversee the fixes you're all talking about. Nefertiti and Shira, I really appreciate your time, both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.
I first met Granite Telecommunications founder and CEO Rob Hale back in 2016 when Governor Charlie Baker invited me to an event that pushed me way outside my comfort zone. So this is going to be okay, right? Hi. I'm hyperventilating. It's for a good cause. Keep saying that. It's for a good cause. I and many others lost a lot of hair that day, but we also raised a ton of money for cancer research, more than $4 million. And since the Saving by Shaving event started more than eight years ago, Hale has donated more than $47 million to the cause with a slew of celebrities from David Ortiz to Tom Brady joining in. Now Hale has embarked on a new big philanthropic challenge, and I mean big enough for Forbes magazine to take note, because he and his wife Karen have been giving away $52 million this year, a million dollars a week, to different small nonprofit groups. Rob joins me now. Rob, it's good to see you. Good to, good to see you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Why'd you decide to do this, you and Karen? Uh, we, as you know, and you've participated directly, we like supporting the community. We feel like it's part of the fabric of who we are. And our previous support has gone to some great institutions, world-changing institutions, but big institutions. And we felt like we were, we were missing a subset that was so important, small, vital, energetic, positive organizations that, that didn't have financial clarity. And we wanted to try to help them. So we focused on 52 smaller organizations. We're, we're giving each of them a million dollars. Generally, we're asking them to make it an endowment with a 5% drawdown, so they'll have $50,000 a year, and they could see their, their selves to a, to a financial future. I am guessing, that can, I read the list of a lot of the 52, uh, I am guessing this is probably the largest gift they've ever gotten in most cases? In most cases, far and away, it's the, the biggest gift they've ever gotten. And is this a Mackenzie Scott kind of thing where people don't apply, you, your wife, and your family decide who you think is deserving, and you just pick them? Is that how it goes? I wish we had Mackenzie Scott kind of volume, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, You're doing pretty well, my friend, yeah, but go ahead. Uh, that's it. That's the case. So there is, uh, in the last week or two, as you know, the interest has peaked up, so we've gotten a slew of requests, but for the first 40 weeks, we would find the organizations and probably the first 20 were easy because we knew so many great organizations in this community that we wanted to help that we'd seen over the years. And then for the maybe the middle 20, we, we reached, we felt like there were great causes. We wanted to find them and we would find them and then reach out to them. How did you, but how do you decide uh, uh, what a great cause is that merits this kind of contribution as opposed to one that doesn't make the cut? Uh, luckily enough, we have teammates who help us, and, and expectations are that it's 501c3 certified. Nonprofit, right? Uh, yes, so, but certified and documented by the government, uh, you know, is doing the right thing. But I mean, are there uh, subject matter areas, are there areas of concern that you particularly directed your giving to? Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, yes, I, I do. And, um, and what are those? So we care dear, dearly for the environment. We care dearly for animals. We care dearly for women's studies. We care dearly mm. for a variety of topics. Those topics, we would then go find organizations that we were proud of. And how do you notify? Uh, I used to run small nonprofits. Unfortunately, I don't anymore, but I used to. <laughs> so how do you notify one of these places? Oh, by the way, we're about to give you the most money you've ever gotten in yes. your whole existence. How, how does that happen? Uh, again, we, we find that organization, and, and then we determine that's the one. So yeah. either Karen or I will then send them an email. Can we have a few minutes of your time? We'll schedule a quick call. And say, hey, listen, you, you don't know us, we don't know you, but we have some happy news we want to share with you. And then we tell them, we're proud of what, we, what, we, what you do, and we want you to do it in perpetuity. We're going to give you a million dollars. What kind of reaction do you generally get? Tears, uh, you know, jo joyful tears, um, you know, excitement, uh, cheering, screaming, but exuberance. You know, you're not old enough to remember a show, I don't think. You ever heard of the, the show The Millionaire, where the guy would knock, walk up to a house, knock on a door, and give him a million-dollar check? Uh, I wasn't around for that, I no. didn't think you were. Okay, well, you're yeah. a, a modern version. So I know you well enough to know that you believe that corporate philanthropy is not just good for the soul or for yes. fellow human beings, but it's also good for the bottom line. Can you, can you explain that a bit? 
I, I do believe that. And, and yes, it's good for, for my soul. It is good, but it's good for my team and my teammates. I, I think that, I think especially the younger generation cares as much about impacting the future of our planet as they do about taking care of themselves. So great teammates, vibrant teammates who will drive our business for generations to come, they want to be part of an organization that's caring for others. So if Granite is identified as a, a philanthropic organization, in fact, we are going to benefit by by the people we attract because they'll be the kind of people we want who will impact the world. And, and, and you know, by the way, I should note that uh, I think it's Forbes has named you one of the best mid-sized businesses to work for in America. I think it's five years in a row. And I assume yes. that, it, it, and I hate to put you in the position, but why exactly have you made the list, do you think, every year? Uh, I think we focus on equity. I think we focus on inclusion. I think we focus on supporting all of our communities. I think we, we have, I know we have an internal progression for people to get promoted and earn better opportunities. We take career development and community involvement and support of our community very seriously. You know, uh, I have been, as you know, to a bunch of those uh, saving uh, by shaving things where you've raised millions of dollars. And what I've done uh, on behalf of this show is in addition to talking to you and some of the celebrities, I always go around, there are uh, uh, endless lines of your employees mm -hmm. in the building. And yes. one of the first questions I would ask them, I don't know if I should admit this to you, was whether or not they felt compelled to be there. Uh, and I have to say, I probably talked to 100 of them through the years. Mm -hmm. I never encountered one, and this is private, never encountered one who was there because they felt, well, the boss really wants me here, so I should be here. But because this feeling of the importance of giving sort of trickles down and out into your mm -hmm. whole deal. I mean, I... I assume that feels pretty good to you, no? It's wonderful. And, and I think you encapsulated what I was just trying to articulate in that folks who join Granite, they, they know and I hope they identify with, uh, with the, the expectation that we're going to be philanthropic. They want to be part of that. So those hundreds of people that you've spoken to, they, as you mentioned, they chose. The, there, there were no pressures. They chose to be there. But, man, those are the kind of people you want to be with. They didn't feel pressure. I felt pressure from Governor Baker, but that's yeah, a whole other yeah. proposition. Yes. So yes. what does this do for you and your wife and your kids and your family? We know what it does for these organizations. Yes. What does this do for you? The gifting? The 52 yeah, the gifting. gifting, yeah. Uh, it makes us more aware, honestly, it makes us more aware of, and especially the last week or so, there are, it makes us aware of the fact that there are many, many, many more organizations that need help. No, I don't, just, I don't just mean that in terms of more giving. I mean, what does this do for you as an individual? I mean, we all operate under this notion that it is better to give, as the proverbial saying mm -hmm. goes. Mm -hmm. what, what does that feel like? What does that do for you? Oh, it makes me feel good. It does make me feel good. It, it is wonderful when you, when you, as you mentioned, we have those calls and people, they go bananas. And you think, <laughs> hey, that we're going to help an animal shelter preserve another hundred dogs' lives every year in perpetuity. And we're gonna help a, a date rape crisis center. And they're gonna help women who really need help. And, and we're gonna help to make sure they can do it in perpetuity. It's an awesome feeling. So what's the second act? Well, with you, the second act isn't appropriate because there've been many acts. What's the next act? How do you follow up on a million bucks a week for a year? What's next? Uh, let's keep that a surprise. Is there something? There is something, yeah, yes? Most, yeah, of course. We, we, you know, philanthropy and being part of the community are very important to Karen and I. So, yes, I do think we are a couple of weeks away from the end of this year, and, and we're full. We, we've got too many organizations right now for the last five, six weeks to, to help, and we will help them as best we can. Probably tap the brakes for a year, but then we're going to think long and hard about th this has been a cool, a really cool process, and, and I like it. Well, you and your wife have done wonderful things. Come back soon. Rob, it's great to see you, and congratulations on all this. By the way, Jim, next next year at Shaving by Shaving, usually we give 5000 mm -hmm. But by the looks of things, I, I could probably <laughs> only give you maybe $2,300. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you're you're going you're to have to get a discount. It hurts, but I'll take it. You know what yes. I mean? Rob Hales. Thank you for your support. Great to see you. Thanks so much, Rob. Bye, Jim.
That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow for Talking Politics. Adam Riley and his panel will dig into Kamala Harris campaigning in Boston and some ugly accusations in the city council. Plus, poll oh, show yeah. Republican <laughs> Jeff Deal headed for a big loss in the governor's race. So why hasn't his campaign shifted gears? That and more tomorrow at 7. I'll be back next week. Thank you for watching. And please don't forget Ukraine. Today, we are going all in on a minor urban mystery here in Boston. In a typical year, the city of Boston issues about 5,000 permits for street excavations. Companies like Comcast and Verizon dig to lay cable. National Grid tears up stretches to repair gas lines. And well over a hundred different private companies working for homeowners or commercial properties lay underground pipes that tap into water mains. Each time a company digs up a Boston street, they are responsible for repairing it when they're done. And crucially, the city has a three-year warranty on every single one of those patches. According to city officials, about 10% of these patches go bad. Cracking, crumbling at the edges, sinking, and they need to be repaired. When that happens, how do city officials know whether that particular patch is still under warranty? And if it is, what company is responsible for fixing it? That's where these guys come in. They are called A-tags, short for asphalt tags, and they are the centerpiece of the city of Boston's street repair tracking system. Though they are but little, about an inch and a half in diameter, they are fiercely informative, if, you know how to decode them. The year the patch was laid is marked at the center of each A tag, so it's easy to quickly identify whether it's still under warranty. As for who laid each patch, city officials devised a color coding system. Now, big companies that do a lot of digging, they get their own custom colors and they get to display their name on their A tags. National Grid, you're yellow. Boston Water and Sewer, you're blue. MWRA, you're light blue. Comcast and Verizon, you're orange. Eversource, you're red. I said the steam company, you're white. Private contractors who work under the streets of Boston get a green A tag with a unique ID number at the top. So all it takes is a quick look at a legend to know who did the job. A tags have been required on every patch laid in the city of Boston since 2011. And companies can be fined if they don't embed their chip. The system has been a rousing success, according to city officials, who say the compliance rate is somewhere between 98 and 99%. As for that last one to 2%, now that you know the code, you too can be an inspector. If you see a failing patch in your neighborhood, call 311 or better yet, snap a pic and tweet it at boss311. So there you have it, the humble A tag, an ace up the city's sleeve that keeps the odds high the streets stay even. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and perhaps more importantly, ante up and let me know what you are curious about, because hey, I might just say, deal me in. I'm Edgar Bihorup III. Stay curious out there. The Curiosity Desk is sponsored by Emerson College, inspiring curiosity and creative expression in all of us.